For those of you that don't know or maybe don't remember, just after the Ready or Not trailer release, there was to be a podcast that was hosted by the good people over at Blacksite, the company that's licensing the guns that are going to be featured in the game. The podcast featured two developers, Ryro and Zed and Grunter, two Twitch streamers, Clean and Tweak, and one big YouTuber, Donut Operator. The goal of the podcast was to get as much information out of the devs as possible. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're going to be talking about. Think of this video as sort of an analysis, but I'm only going to cover the details about the game and not so much the banter that went on during the podcast, which if you want to see the podcast, the link is in the description. But with all that being said, let's get started. So in the beginning of the podcast, they introduced themselves and explain why they decided to go with the SWAT game, which is actually pretty interesting if you listen to it. They then go on to explain why they decided to create this type of gameplay trailer. The developer states that their original reveal trailer was made to portray their type of story cinematics, and then they say that the sole purpose of creating this type of gameplay trailer was to show off the features and mechanics. So this was actually the first time that I had actually rewatched this podcast, and as I'm listening to this part, I noticed that the developer acknowledges that compared to the original trailer, it might seem a little flavorless, which if anybody has seen any of my previous videos that I had commented on the trailer itself, I thought that the gameplay trailer was actually kind of lukewarm because the majority of the mechanics that were shown, I already knew about. Basically, if you're someone that was following Ready or Not extensively, then you probably wouldn't like the trailer, while it's the opposite for somebody that didn't know about the game. But anyways, they ended it off with saying that they didn't want to ham up the game too much in that gameplay trailer. Personally, I would have preferred raw, unedited footage, you know, of just like doing one whole mission. That's what I would have liked to have seen, but obviously I'm in the minority, as you can tell by the gigantic viewership of that gameplay trailer video, which got, I think, it's sitting at around 3 million as I talk, I think. But anyways, let's move on. Then they start talking about the lore of Ready or Not, lore meaning story and whatnot. The game follows a character named Judge, which isn't his real name, it's, it's a code name. According to the developers, Judge is a SWAT veteran who recently joined the Metro Police SWAT department in Los Angeles. Then they say in the game they are going to touch on a lot of topics that are going to affect people in different ways, but ultimately they had to leave it there. They said that saying more would spoil the story. Instead of trying to talk about the story outright, they thought it best to talk about it from a gameplay perspective. They say that the campaign is you, as Judge, progressing through the story by successfully completing a mission. As you move on to the next missions, the score that you'll need to complete the mission will continue to rise as progress is being made. This will more than likely require less than lethal weapons to complete. Basically, the more people that you have handcuffed without killing, the better your score will be. The difficulty rises through the campaign and how you are required to handle the situation. Donut Operator asks, is the main character going to have a mustache? They have a little bit of banter, and then the developer replies with no, but we do have one guy on the SWAT team who has a mustache. His name is Eli, who is the oldest SWAT officer on the team, and apparently loves his MP7s. The only operator that we actually know publicly is Alabama, Judge, and now Eli, which I think is half the team. Moving on. They then go on to talk about death in the game, asking if it changes anything at all. They state that their story is quite passive. Death isn't really integral to the campaign. Cinematics are rare. If you want to know the story of what's really going on, you have to pay close attention. They pondered the idea of having a good or bad ending, but given the situation that they're in, it's definitely not confirmed. But the developers have said that they could could be lying, so it's really up in the air. They then discuss realism and how far the game is willing to go, but they clearly state that the game isn't a full-on simulation. They are going to try to get it as real as possible, but not without sacrificing the fun gameplay. They like games that don't hold your hand, the feeling of figuring it out on your own. Then the question of inspiration arises. What inspired you to make the game? To which they replied with, we used to play hours upon hours of SWAT 4 and Rainbow Six 3, and there just hasn't been any game like those to come out. Inspiration also came from noir films, like Chinatown and Green Noir. <sighs> Are those films going to be hints for Carcosa? Am I going to have to go watch those movies? 
Oh, I hope not. Their creative director really gets into it when they're, you know, designing those levels, trying to incorporate noir themes that were featured in the films. They didn't want levels to be generic. They wanted them to be different from other games by using authenticity to be unique. Then they were later asked if any of the missions were inspired by real life events. And to that they say, yes, there are plenty. In fact, the game was apparently inspired by a siege that happened in Sydney, known as the Sydney Siege. But obviously these events aren't meant to be glorified or idolized, they are meant to be shown in a respectable way because it's just what happens. It's real life. And that's all they really had to say about that. After that, the panel asks what type of factions are going to be in the game. SWAT, obviously. Negotiators to get some hostages out of the area. Random onlookers. The fire department to knock out the power, disable fire alarms, and cut off water mains. They describe these key features as being useful if you want to shut off the loud fire alarms because you literally can't hear anything. And the sprinkler system apparently apparently blurs the vision. For the multiplayer, there is a rogue organization that has yet to be named. He says that there's some members that are comprised of... I think he says sleep? Sleep members? But I I couldn't hear what he said in this part, mostly because the audio cuts out here. They have stated that it's kind of like an IRA organization. And this is the part where we think that he gives us a clue for Carcosa when he says, you may notice that one of them is holding something that alludes to something else in the gameplay trailer, which we think that that's a clue. At about the 1630 mark, that's when he says it. They also have the FBI, HRT, SWAT teams, because apparently there's a mission where they do joint operations, which uses federal and local PD. After that, there's a lot of banter, but they begin to talk about customization. They say that you are able to look the way that you want to look. You can import a patch that goes on your shoulder. You can switch out headgear, face wear. It's enough customization to keep us interested for a while. They say that there's a grand total of eight different swamp models that you could choose from, and they all have backstories. They state that they do want to add more characters in the near future, which is actually kind of cool. And no, it's not like Rainbow Six Siege where these specific characters are going to have special abilities abilities that are exclusive to them. No, it's not like that. They're not going to have special abilities. They're just, you know, like a customization piece. The main difference being the face and the voice actor with different lines. As far as gear goes, they say that there's over 60 unique items in the game. After that, Clean asks the question, what about Carcosa? And the developers really didn't say anything there, which is interesting because they were asked, but they ended up dropping some hints here and there inside of the podcast here, which if there's more, I'll definitely look into. A question was asked about what kind of modes will be in the campaign, which I thought was kind of odd, but maybe they were thinking that the campaign was to be a multiplayer campaign. But one of the developers had stated that the storyline campaign is to be pretty linear. The levels themselves do vary though, so you can solve the missions in any particular way that you want. They say that they have a hub or HQ level where you can go and hang out before every mission, trying out new guns and training in the kill house. I remember theorizing about this in the trailer analysis video if I'm not mistaken. I gotta say that that's actually a really cool feature. I'm glad that that's in the game. Apparently, while you're in the HQ, you can actually walk around and listen to people talking. You'll get to hear the side conversations from all the characters while you're walking around, which is actually actually pretty cool. The way that they describe it, it sounds a lot like Metro Exodus where after every mission you get downtime. During this downtime, the game allows you to walk around the train and talk to other characters about what just happened in the previous mission. And every time that you go back to the train, it looks different. That's basically what they described about Ready or Not. But you're mostly in the kill house, training or checking out new guns that you want to use for your next mission. But you can also walk around the HQ listening listening to side conversations with other SWAT units about the previous mission that just happened, which if you paid enough attention about what happened in the mission, you'll know what they're talking about. According to the devs, the HQ will look different after every mission, so dialogue will most likely be different as the HQ shifts. At this point in the conversation, the devs state that in the campaign, you only play as one SWAT officer, codenamed Judge. You never play as the bad guy, but I'm sure that you're able to pick and choose what you want for teammates because I'm sure that the teammates are going to have their own dialogue as they go through each mission. The next thing that they talk about is a medical system and Ready or Not is not going to have a medical system at launch. It's not confirmed if they're going to do it or not but the SWAT officers and the paramilitary force that's on the other team for multiplayer both have medical kits on their sides. It's probably not off the table that they're going to add that or not but basically the whole conversation goes like in real life you'll probably get shot and either die or go down but in the game you're obviously 
obviously not gonna you know go down immediately unless they shoot you in a specific spot basically the game is gonna take a swap four approach where you get hit and you, you don't really heal yourself you're just kind of start limping everywhere depending on where you get hit that is like they have a system where if you get shot in the shoulder then your aim is gonna be a little off if you get shot in the leg you're gonna start limping hitting the head your vision might get a little blurry like it's that type of system it's kind of like tarkov kind of but yeah that's basically what they're explaining here then they begin to talk about what multiplayer modes are going to be featured in the game of course there's your team deathmatch mode where you have waves and get reinforced when you die there's the vip escort mode that's basically escorting the vip to a spot on the map while the other team has to try and arrest and secure the vip for a certain amount of time and then kill them there's apparently a gun game mode too but they didn't go into heavy detail on that they also said that they want to add a party mode system so that the community can actually customize their own game modes they also state that they're working with people who are more familiar with the swap 4 multiplayer modes which is pretty cool they said that they would be open to adding new game modes like rapid deployment and bomb defusal which if anybody knows what those game modes are more power to you then they talk about the pre-planning phase that happens just before a match or a mission in the planning phase you can set up things like sniper teams you can knock out the power you can plan your whole entry to the letter on a map if you wanted to there's various entry points to look at there's various deployables that you can pick up like a shield battering ramp grenade launcher or telescopic ladder you can either pick them up or assign them to a team member the levels themselves are very customizable in the way that you go about them there is also going to be a briefing that gives you an idea of what you're getting into but of course it's only what SWAT knows in other words even if you have a description of the area that you're getting into the information that is being told to you could possibly be false so expect anything they talk about other tools that every officer can use because the deployables like battering rams shields and whatnot is limited one tool that you can use is the helmet cam to check up on your teammates by physically pulling out a tablet you can see what they see from their helmet cam basically the same concept as SWAT 4 but with a more realistic sense there's a multi-tool for picking doors a wedge for blocking doors if you want to go in loud you can use t2 explosives and blow the door right open they say as you play through the game you'll earn points getting enough points will unlock deployables like grenade launchers shields battering rams etc that you can take off of the bearcat that you and your teammates rode in on this also includes a tactical ladder that you can use to get the height advantage and they say that it really changes up the map they also have drones really good for scouting out the area they state here that the grenade launcher can actually launch cs gas stingers and flashbangs they say that you're not necessarily limited when it comes to choices but they say that you're limited on what you can bring at a certain time in a lot of back and forth they briefly acknowledge that you'll be able to shoot through doors but that if you want to go that route you'll probably need to make sure what's on the other side so they recommend using an opti wand before doing that clean brings up a question that talks about matchmaking he asks can a player that plays solo play by himself to which they reply yes the devs aren't going to lock teams so if somebody wants to join they should be able to join seamlessly granted there's a slot open the developers have stated that they want a big emphasis on team play so it's never going to be two versus five in each game they later state that you can actually kill with the battering ram and possibly a taser take that one with a grain of salt because i'm not sure if that was true or not Apparently Apparently when you hit them with the battering ram they actually go flying <laughs> sounds fun they also talk about if someone just so happens to be standing on the other side of a door and you ram it or use a charge on it there's a high possibility that that guy could go flying after that they talk about progression they say that it splits up into two facets you got single player progression which is based on levels that you do which will have level appropriate unlocks he gives an example by referencing the port or shipping crate level it's different because it unlocks night vision goggles as as well as a weapon that assists you more than others this apparently stems from an idea that comes from easy streets elite force mod quote you've got unlocks as you go it's fantastic it's really a brilliant way of introducing new weapons to the player as they tackle new environments unquote for the multiplayer they said that you basically have a standard progression system where i'm guessing that if you play enough your level just keeps going up but they said that they're trying to do something different here they see that they're experimenting with upgrade point rewards the way that you get those is by action which is based entirely on what weapon you use i find this interesting because i have no idea what the hell he's talking about at least he gives an example here let's see for example with a less than lethal shotgun you might have to hit the player and then arrest them the report may not be necessary it rewards experience towards getting points 
then the other developer says, just to clarify, the more points that you have, the more attachments you can put on the gun. Oh, okay. That initial explanation is still a little confusing to me, though. If anybody wants to clear it up down in the comments, maybe, let me know. This could also help with unlocking skins. Skins that make sense, not like a, you know, neon pink sort of thing. Then they talk about servers. They say that you can local host and that they also have dedicated servers available, although they are unsure if they are going to go through a provider or not. Then they move on to talking about AI. The developers state, in the co-op, the AI has various morale states, meaning that they could be aggressive or defensive. They will try to fake out the player by pretending to put their hands up. If a bad guy gets flashbanged, it's possible for them to blindly fire at you. The AI could be completely unpredictable, which is a far cry away from any other AI this generation. Donut Operator asks if there is going to be a limit on handcuffs and how many that you can have, and the developer replies with, no, it's unlimited. Then they ask what kind of response the AI will have once we use force on them. If we injure the AI, they'll try and limp away. Their reactions will be slowed and accuracy will be reduced. Headshots will be one kill most of the time. The developer sums it up like this. Each AI is its own situation. The AI is not only trying to interact with you, but also other suspects and civilians. So we'll have to basically manage all of that. Then they proceed to talk about melee, and the developers say that in the beginning, the game won't feature melee, but later on down the line, they'll most likely add it in. Donut asks about the size of the pepper spray, and the devs say it's relatively small. <laughs> It's not the size that matters. Then they talk about the taser. Now at the timing of this podcast, they state that tasers basically work on every enemy, but that they want to change that in the distant future. They want to implement the thickness of clothing and also people that are really hyped up on drugs. He might be so hyped up that he just doesn't even feel the taser. But they want to make sure that the player has some sort of indication that they are hyped up on drugs so that they don't get that, oh, how come that didn't work feeling. They also want to add a feature where old people have the possibility of dying if you tase them. You you can actually give them a heart attack. Then they talk about how the AI could deceive you. They say that the AI might put down its main weapon, but as you move up to try and arrest them, they could draw their secondary on you. So you have to be very careful. That's just one of the things that they're going to try and do to deceive you. But the developers have said that they want to explore more ways on how to deceive the player. Like maybe they'll plant a gun on a hostage. Who knows? We'll see in the future. At this point in the video, they re-explain the point system again because they asked if there was going to be any incentive to bring these people in you know handcuffed the way that it goes is basically the more people you bring in unharmed the better your score will be and score counts towards points and you can use those points to bring more stuff into your next mission they say that you could do good in missions if you go guns blazing but you have to follow some certain rules before you open fire you have to make sure of two things either he's already shooting at you or he's aiming the weapon at you if he's aiming the weapon or already shooting at you then you can fire back and take him down or incapacitate him but it is not guaranteed that you'll get a hundred out of a hundred unless you follow those specific rules like you can't just see a bad guy and immediately shoot him you know you have to scream and yell at him hey get down on the ground you dickhead they asked the devs that the game is just going to be hardcore all around and they said that there will be an alternative mode for people who just want to have fun and not really take the game seriously after that they talk about map design and replayability they say that they want to make sure that the maps never feel dull and when it comes to replayability they say that the ai will spawn a different areas most of the time. The AI will have varying levels of skill and varying equipment. So basically, if you tried to go through the same level maybe 10 times, it'll be different every time with the AI in different spots and with different equipment on. When it comes to map design, they say that the most that will change is probably the locks on the door. They are currently experimenting with trying to move things around the room just to keep it a little fresh, keep you on your guard. But at the timing of this podcast, they don't have that. Then they talk about motion capture. They say that they want all movement to be motion capture, but at the timing of this podcast everything that's in first person is actually done by hand but they say that sooner or later they're going to switch it over to motion capture they say that they want to do motion capture at 240 frames which they acknowledge is pretty high but it looks really good when you're going into the replay viewer to look at your characters in action then they talk about facial animations they say that they're not motion capture they're mostly done by hand mainly because it wasn't really a priority because i think most of the time we're probably going to be wearing masks anyway but they do want to add facial animations because they want to have the ai look like they've been injured 
badly and have their face show that. You know, they want expressions. They then talk about cutscenes, to which the developers reply, they aren't really going to be big cutscenes, they're just going to be tiny scenes that feature mocap. Then they go on to talk about how relatively easy it is to add people into the game because they have a scanning system that scans people and puts them in the game. Like people literally are the character models, which is actually pretty interesting and really revolutionary if you think about it. They then discuss ray tracing. At the moment, the game doesn't have it, but they are planning on upgrading the engine for the game so that they can implement it later. They then bring up the fact that most tactical shooters have like a sluggish feel to them or they feel a little clunky and the developers of Ready or Not basically reassured that they're trying to have more of a smooth feeling when it comes to transitioning between you know weapons or stances or aiming that's basically the full conversation here free look and track ir will be supported according to the developers they talk about the dynamic lean which was apparently inspired by rainbow six three where you control the height and direction it's a little different in ready or not because you hold down the alt or whatever you assign it to and wasd along with crouch to do a bunch of different leans with this lean feature implementation you'll be able to hop on your tippy toes or crouch all the way down to look underneath a bed which to me sounds like there's going to be a lot of possibilities in this game they briefly mention the weapon collision where if you get too close to the wall he's going to either put his weapon up or down then they begin to talk about the hud they say that it's very minimalistic almost hidden which if you've seen from my previous videos then you would know but they say that there's a speed indicator which is the boxes that are at the bottom right there's a magazine indicator that is attached to your palm when you're either reloading or checking your mag then there is a compass that usually sits up at the top but you are able to flick it on and off if you don't want it or you do want it when you look at friendlies there is an indicator that shows their name tag and also their speed indicator which i guess is for stamina reasons because i can't think of any other reason why they would add that in but then again i haven't played the game yet so i'm not sure how useful that uh, indicator is going to be then they talk about the gear wheel which basically allows you to select any tools that you need for a specific situation it includes things like your stingers flashbangs your weapons indicators for how many mags are left for each weapon it also shows how much weight you're carrying and apparently there's an indicator that shows where you got hit they call it sort of a uh, feedback point in the podcast here to very quickly assess the situation they then talk about gearing guns the devs start out by saying that they have a wide variety of guns and customization options but it's not as in-depth as escape from tarkov or ground branch to name a few but it's good enough to keep you going the weapons that they have can range anywhere from the 1960s all the way up to modern day again they say that they have over 60 items but that doesn't include all the optics that you can use for your weapons which well that's pretty cool the weapons range from the 1960s all the way to modern day and they say that they're going to expand on that as more updates come out although we don't know if those updates are going to be free or if they're going to be behind dlc we'll have to see about that but even if if they are behind DLC, more than likely they're going to be multiple guns, not just like one gun. Then they talk about reloads. They say something about stage reloads, which I'm not entirely sure what that means, but it's not implemented just yet, or as of this podcast video anyway, which is podcast is like a few months old, I think. It was back in March, so maybe they already implemented it. Who knows? They say that the game has a quick reload and a regular one. The quick reload drops the mag while the other one retains it. They also talk about a cool feature where if you and your friend have the same weapon or ammo type, you can toss each other mags. They say that there's a cool Cool toss and catch animation when you do that. How interesting. It's here that the developers say that they want to make sure that weapon handling is smooth. They then talk about suppressors. They say that suppressors are going to be a little more realistic. Like they aren't going to be that quiet. They're not going to do the number. The developers say that the longer barrel actually gives the gun a little more damage, but it's so minuscule that you probably won't even notice it, but it might just give the gun a little more penetration. The suppressor hides your flash and has less smoke ejecting. He follows that up by saying, if you stand in one spot long enough and you're shooting, there's going to be a lot of smoke that kind of messes with your visibility a little bit it's not going to be a full-on smoke screen but you know it's 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 going to be there they say that suppressors could be a pain in the ass if you try to go through a door sideways or get too close to a wall with their leaning system and weapon collision it could it has its ups and downs after that they talk about licensing they say that they've been working with black site to get in touch with fn sti trigicon polymer they've been working with a lot of people but nothing's set in stone after that they talk about penetration and they say that it's based entirely on the muzzle velocity, the actual round itself, and the material that you're hitting, which they follow that up by saying they have around 50 materials. But really, it just comes down to the type of bullet that you have, at what angle you're at. It, it just really depends if it's going to go through or not. Then they talk about ammo types. There's FMJ, JHP, and they're looking at soft point, but they might only stick with a single grain, whatever that means. Then they discuss gore, referencing Dev Block 2, which was made about two years ago, so they never took into consideration on how hard that would be to implement so at the timing of this podcast it's not currently in the game but they
they say that it's still in production. It's not gonna be like, you know, Dead Space where like chunks are just flying everywhere, but it's gonna be realistic enough so that when you actually shoot somebody, it, you know, it's gonna show bullet holes and things like that. If you hit them in a specific spot, they can bleed out. They'll do an animation of trying to get down on the floor and you see like the blood flowing out, which I believe they actually showed on their Twitter, if I'm not mistaken. At this point, I skipped about 20 minutes because they're just talking about the pre-orders, but then they bring up mods. They say that they wanna add mods post-release because they think that it's a net positive for Ready or Not. Then they talk about the alpha. They say that they're going to do like a tiny section of the game that won't spoil the campaign. It'll have one campaign mission and various PVP modes, which I'm guessing will feature maybe one or two maps for the multiplayer. And the beta will be relatively the same, just with a few more maps and more people coming into the fray. The alpha is basically going to showcase single player, co-op, multiplayer, while the beta is more of a stress test, according to the developers. They are definitely going to want as much feedback as possible. So anybody that's in those beta or alphas, be sure to let them know. They say that the alpha is only going to be alpha weekends, but after a couple of those, they may possibly open it up, but we'll have to see about that one. Of course, the alpha is under NDA, and they say that the beta might be too, but if the alpha and the beta both receive good feedback, then they might consider letting people show the game like on YouTube and stuff. They said that it really just depends on the state of the game and how people are liking it. After that, they briefly talk about DLC, saying, quote, they're going international. They say that there's a lot that they want to explore, and they're also inspired by a lot of films. He didn't say which one because apparently it'll give it away. They're going to be dropping two things, DLC and expansions. DLC will just be like weapons and skins, and expansions will be more like different styles of play and new areas to explore, you know, that type of thing. The first DLC will be a international agency from a film. It's pretty vague, but that's what he says. They say that players are still going to be able to play with each other even though they have, like if one person has the expansion and the other person doesn't they can still play with each other you know because they're friends i remember them saying a while back that it's gonna be like uh i think they said arma 2 if i remember correctly it was gonna be something like that somewhere on the reddit i don't remember moving on from that this next one it's as if they were reading back my theory that i had for the game a while ago they say that you're going to be discovering something very concerning about the city that you're working in and there are connections that get made throughout every mission that you go through i had this theory what if all the missions that you go through are going to be linked together into one big thing you know i was oh man oh when i heard this i was like what yeah i think i guessed it right boys and that's basically the end of the podcast or at least when it comes to information a good majority of the information that i talked about was stuff that i already knew but you know i decided to make this video just in case you know there's a lot of people that didn't even know about the podcast the podcast itself is a lot longer and if you do want to watch it it is down in the description there is a lot of banter between the guests and the hosts and you might actually enjoy it me going through it a second time it was actually not that bad but with that i want to thank everybody for coming out to watch and i guess i'll catch you in the next one Bye bye